Hello everyone, and this week in particular, with all the weather warnings that are going on, a very warm welcome to the Disability and Jesus Sunday service for today, the 17th of July, as we think about the ways in which God calls us to use our gifts in his service. I pray that this service, together yet apart, would be a time for all of us to be refreshed and renewed in our faith and in our discipleship. It's very good to be with you, and you are very welcome to be with us. Our prayers of confession today are adapted from a We Worship book by the Iona community. Let us remember our own faults and failings. Holy God, maker of all, have mercy on us. Jesus Christ, Son of Mary, have mercy on us. Holy Spirit, breath of life, have mercy on us. We pray together. In the community of Christ Church and in the presence of all God's people, we confess to God that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved God, cared for God's world or respected God's people as we should. We own our responsibility and pray for God's pardon. And as you ponder the image on screen of someone stood with their arms outstretched and chains now broken, receive these words of forgiveness. May God forgive us. May Christ befriend us. May the Spirit renew us and change our lives. Amen. Almighty God, send down upon your church the riches of your spirit and kindle in all who minister the gospel your countless gifts of grace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The gospel reading is taken from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42, from the New International Version. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our reading today makes me think about the ways in which things have changed in society and in church over the years. I think back to when I was studying history for my O-levels. I guess I'm old enough to have done O-levels. And we learned about the Victorian period and all the changes that were brought in to improve people's lot and give people a reasonably decent place to live instead of slums whole families in one room. Sadly, often it seems as if we're back to those days in some places. But thinking about the ways in which things have progressed makes me think about the ways in which opportunities have changed for so many different people. If I'd been born a hundred years earlier than I was, there's no way that I would ever have been able to contemplate going to university. There's probably very little likelihood that I would have ever been able to go into full-time Christian ministry and be ordained. But things have changed. Things have moved on. The role of women in society is radically different to what it was 100, 200 years ago. And progress has been made in so many different areas. And partly that's about society and usually a little bit after that, the church catching up with what Jesus would like to see. And today's Gospel reading tells us quite a bit about how Jesus 
envisaged his church being. Because there's this episode of Jesus at Mary and Martha's house, which says so much about the ways in which Jesus viewed different people's roles and didn't see that as limited by their gender, or I would argue their ability or disability, their ethnicity, or anything else. Jesus was born into a society where people very much knew their place, and that kind of society persisted, and in some places and in some ways continues to persist uh, all the way through to the present day. But it was certainly the case in the world in which Jesus walked and talked and lived and loved 2,000 years ago. People knew their place. They knew their role. And a lot of that was dependent upon who you were, which family you came from, where you were born, what your nationality was, and possibly, above all else, what your gender was. And so we meet Jesus today in the house of Mary and Martha at Bethany. And so often we, we read this little story of, of Mary sitting at Jesus' feet and Martha busy in the kitchen as a kind of contrast between the active and the contemplative life. Mary sat there, as it were, doing nothing, being with Jesus, and Martha is busy doing all those practical things that, let's be fair, have to be done. But is it just, or is it even mainly, about this contrast between an active life and a contemplative life? I don't think it is. I think it's about something much deeper. Contrast the fact that Martha was doing what society would expect her to be doing, sorting everything out in the kitchen, getting the meal ready, and all the rest of it, versus Mary, who was very much not doing what she would be expected to do. Mary was sat there at the master's feet like a disciple, like actually a student rabbi, a role that just wasn't open to women. Mary was usurping the role that society demanded of her as a woman and taking a role as a, a disciple, a student rabbi, a role reserved for men in the eyes of society. This is very radical. And we can hardly read this with the surprise that it would engender in the minds of people who would have read it 2,000 years ago or heard the story 2,000 years ago. For a start, men and women were usually apart. It's shameless for Jesus to be in a room on his own with this woman. It's shameless for her to be adopting the position of a disciple, of a student rabbi. But this whole episode is a trumpet call to us as Jesus followers about the kind of church and the kind of society we are meant to be. We suffer so much from the legacy of the past. We, we often fit the roles that we're expected to fill. We wait to be told what to do. We know our place. And we do that unconsciously. We just, we just live that way because it's the way that we've been conditioned to live in so many ways. But Jesus doesn't want his church to be like that. Jesus wants his church to be more like Mary. Jesus wants his church to be about being with him, about learning from him, about taking the role that he offers us as participants in the work of his kingdom, not passive, not taking on the roles that others demand of us, but taking on the role that Jesus gives us. For Mary, it was about coming out of what was expected of her and taking seriously what Jesus needed of her. It was about allowing herself to be equipped for a new future, a future in which reaching out in mission and ministry would be the hallmark of church life, of the life of Jesus' followers, and therefore learning at Jesus' feet was paramount. Not something that she should be ashamed of, but something that in fact Martha should feel guilty about not doing. We live in so many ways with the legacy of the past. What should you do? What place 
should you occupy. But in reality, we need to be, as the church, a sign to people that this isn't how it should be. Things have changed in so many ways, thankfully, over the years. And we've seen progress in church for inclusion on the basis of gender or race. And we need to continue pushing for inclusion in all its respects, and particularly, as we think about it this morning, the inclusion of disabled people fully in the life and ministry of God's church. Because this gospel reading tells us that that is a gospel imperative. There are great needs and great opportunities out there in the world and in the church that need the voice and the participation and the commitment of all kinds of people. And there should be no knowing your place because there should be no particular place to know. Our only place is the place to which God calls us. Mary saw the need to assume that place when she set aside the things that she'd always done, the things she'd been taught and expected to do, and she sat at the Master's feet, being trained for discipleship, for mission and ministry. Hers was a radical choice, but one that all disciples have to take in order to be of help in growing the kingdom as it bursts on the world following Easter and Pentecost. I wonder, sisters and brothers, where our opportunities are to be prepared by Jesus for mission and ministry. I wonder where our opportunities are to be used by Jesus in his mission and ministry, to be confident in his love, in his power and in his presence to the world and the church around us, to help the church together move forward, to be more what Jesus calls us to be, I began by looking back 100, 200 years to the way things used to be. What a legacy it would be for our generation to leave. If in a hundred years, people looked back at the church of the early 21st century and said, they were the people who finally got what Jesus meant. They were the generation who made sure that inclusion went from being more than a word and a concept to a reality. They were the people who recognised the gifts and the talents of all of God's people, all fearfully and wonderfully made in God's image, all with a calling upon their lives to mission and ministry. I pray, sisters and brothers, that we can all be like Mary, not turning our back on the past and ignoring all we've learned from it, but not being constrained by the expectations of previous generations or of the culture around us, instead being liberated to sit at our master's feet, to learn about being a disciple, to go and exercise the ministry and mission of God's kingdom and to set the scene for the church of today and of tomorrow. For Mary and for all of Jesus' disciples who sat at his feet, life would never be the same again listening to Jesus' vision, listening to what he required of them as his disciples, opened their minds, their hearts and their lives to being part of the revealing of the kingdom of God. May that be true of you and of me, day after day. Amen. For our prayers of intercession today, we're going to use the response, Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. So when I say, Lord, in your mercy, we respond together, receive our prayer. Let's pray. Lord of glory, it is good that we are here. In peace, we make our prayer to you. In trust, we confirm our faith in you. Help us to set our faces steadfastly to where you would have us go. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. Lord of glory. Look with favour on your church, proclaiming your beloved Son to the world and listening to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. May we, your church, be renewed in holiness, that we may reflect your glory. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. 
Lord of glory, look with favour on the nations of the world, scarred by hatred, strife and war. And particularly at this time, we think of Ukraine and the people of Sri Lanka. May they be healed by the touch of your hand. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. Lord of glory, look with favour on those in need and distress, suffering as your son has suffered and waiting for the salvation you promise. May the day break and Christ the morning star bring them, bring us, the light of his presence. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. Lord of glory, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord's Prayer Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.